Hi, I'm Jane Mudgett. Good to see you today. I'm a coach, I'm an author, I'm a presenter, and today I'm here with a special guest. Mary Ann Drew is, a, is an integration coach, and it's really fascinating, uh, and I wanted to learn so much more about this. As an executive coach, it's quite different. So, Marianne, welcome. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to three topics that we have on our agenda. So would you first introduce this idea of what an integration coach is? Sure, yeah. So most of the time I call myself a life coach because most people understand that term better okay. than integration. But specifically integration coach sees all the stories that you're telling yourself in your head that you're not usually aware of. I'm not aware of the stories that I tell of myself in my head, which is why I have a coach. <laughs> and we find all those little um, nuances in the story that are not in integrity with what you are going for, what your goals are, what your um, dreams are, what you say you want out of life. We find where the stories are out of integrity. They're not in alignment um, either logically or energetically. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And we tease all those out and we, we show you what's going on in your mind. That's what I do. I show you, show you what's going on in your mind so that you can really see how you're getting the results that you're getting. So instead of being confused, no one's allowed to be confused. Right. <laughs> instead of being you know, frustrated and wondering what's going on, you can see exactly what's going on and exactly what's creating the results that you're getting. And then I teach you exactly how to get the results that you want. Also wow. with integration coaching is looking at all those parts of ourselves that we're rejecting the authentic personality traits to push away from ourselves in order to be accepted by either our caregivers or our peer group and to those parts of us that are, are really there and are sort of like a toddler that's being ignored, screaming to be acknowledged and understood and reintegrating those parts of ourselves that we have pushed away from ourselves and um, becoming whole again and being able to interact. And the end goal, right, is to be able to interact and show up as our authentic selves, show right. up in integrity with ourselves and show up in wholeness in, in all of our aspects of our life. Yeah. I, that really resonates with me because I've certainly be, been in positions where um, uh, I am not in sync with whatever I'm, I'm doing. So my true self is not there. Myself, who I believe the group needs or the other person needs, shows up. So it's interesting to be able to, I, I think of being in sync, your true self, your authentic self being in sync. So that is, um, that's a long process. Generally speaking, do you have clients that are with you for months at a time to work through these issues? Yes, typically people will start with me for about six months at a time, yeah. and then they'll sign on for another six months, sometimes 18. Um, sometimes I'll help see people for six months, and then I won't see them for a year, and then they'll come back for another six okay. months. Yeah. just depends on you know what their pain point is and how much it's disrupting their lives. <laughs> right, maybe for a tune-up, as I would call it, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate you investing time and sharing what that definition is. And one of the things that you do really well, and other people have said that you've done well, and you have also shared it, is this idea of developing community. Um, it, it's, it's a little transition from uh, integration coaching or life coaching, but it may be an element of life coaching. So tell me about building a community. Well, that's really interesting that you, you say that it, it you know, may not be what most people think of with integration right. coaching, right. but when you are interacting with the community, you are integrated with that right. community. So just like the human body is integrated, we're not just a separation of systems where you know, our body is systems interacting with one another on the very you know, micro level of DNA interacting with DNA to our respiratory system, right? We're an integrated whole person. And when we're part of a community, we're an integrated part of that community. And I think it's a community is a not, uh, it's, it's not emphasized enough when we talk about health, when we talk about 
the health of communities, when we talk about the health of the world, and we talk about the health of the individual. Mm -hmm. And there's been a number of studies that, that study physical health and people, you know, people who are centenarians, people, you know, over a hundred years old, mm -hmm. and people are very curious with this. <laughs> Seems like our society, our society is um, collectively terrified of death. So we're always trying to analyze how people who seem to escape it for longer than the rest of us, what they do, and we want to try to emulate what they do. And they have found in a number of studies when they interview these people that, you know, there's not a whole lot of constants when it comes to diet, when it comes to lifestyle, there's not a whole lot of constants, but what they have found is a constant mm -hmm. is feeling supported and feeling very connected to the people around you. Right. Um, where there's a sense of joy, feeling understood, feeling just very empathetic connection with the people around them. And it's right. baffled scientists who want to say, you know, in order to live a happy, healthy, long life, you have to not smoke and not drink and not eat junk food. But these people have just been thrown in the face of all that data right. and proven a lot of it to be not quite what we think it is because these people will have a cigar every day and a beer or whiskey or whatever it is and they live very long healthy lives and right. I, I, I think it's you know worth really taking a look at that connection that they have to their community that could be you know a bigger factor than most people give it weight. <laughs> Well, you and I are absolutely in sync on that because I strongly believe on that, uh, of, in that, and include that in my book, Five Alive. I talk about that in the chapters regarding friends and family and fun. Your community may not be your family. They may be, but it's certainly this network of people with whom you have a, a strong level of trust and agreement, and you are willing to sit down and have a cigar with them or a glass of wine. But it may be those folks that you're closest to that you care for and care for you. And, and I'm with you. The research in the last five years, maybe up to 10, maybe more than five years, but not more than 10, has really, really supported that idea about having a community. Uh, now, you do a couple things that I don't do, which is use uh, software and apps like Meetup and Marco Polo, and that helps you keep in touch with your community as well. Are you still using those as well? Oh, yes, heavily. Yes. Yeah. I, they should I be your Marco sponsors. Polo. Yeah. They should be I, your sponsors. You know right? I say that all the time. I, know. I say that Marco Polo should be sending me a check because yeah. I am advertising for them yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just switch gears completely because. When it comes to our next topic, I just always am into things that are related to cognitive, uh, uh, well, CBT, cognitive behavior training, and different kinds of therapy available. And there's one when you and I talked earlier that really jumped out, and it's CTFAR. So the first thing, I have to use my cheat notes, the first thing is circumstances. So that's your C. The T is thoughts feelings, actions, and results. So that's, that's the acronym. So tell me more about what CTFAR is. And is that the correct way to say it? Yeah. So some people call it the model. Lots of life okay. coaches and public you know, speakers. I think Tony Robbins have used the, has used the model. Uh, my coach uses the model. I use the model. And I actually use that model in tandem with Byron Katie's. Uh, four questions, or is called the work by Byron Katie, as a methodology to confronting our thoughts and beliefs, mm -hmm. to see how, not just theoretically, but we can really connect the dots between what someone is thinking and believing, and exactly how that is getting them the results that they want in a way mm -hmm. that is really undeniable. If somebody really wants to be honest with themselves and start taking responsibility for their results um, and, you know, throw off the victim mindset <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the CTFAR method really shows by connecting the dots in my mind, this is my opinion, where it becomes really, really hard to deny the fact that our thoughts and beliefs really do create our results. 
and I can show that to people in a non-threatening way, non-confrontational way. I'm just showing them the, the data, if you will. And I let them make their decisions about what they see. Mm-hmm. So then what I see, and they can decide whether they want to deny it or not. <laughs> right. But it's, I think it's a great tool for clarity. And then it's a tool for change as well. So if this is the formula, like if we were in a, a lab, right? And this input plus this, this input very observably, right? Or observationally, is that the... That you observe the input. Right? Then if that, if that very consistently creates the result, then we can change our inputs. Right. To create a different result. And it's, it's a very powerful tool for changing our entire lives. And yeah. our, not just our, circum, our actual reserve, results and circumstances we create, but our experience of those circumstances, which are all neutral, by the way. That's a, mm-hmm. something that <laughs> when I bring the model to people and I say, first of all, we have to get clear on something. All right. circumstances are neutral. <laughs> right. right. And the way the model has been helpful for me um, I, and I'm going to use very simplistic terms that for, for me is that that changed the way I had positive self-talk because it was tied in a little bit with imposter syndrome. And so once I identified these circumstances and thoughts and feelings, then my self-talk could change. And then the, the net result was that my behavior changed as well. So that's how I implemented that when I became aware of the model. So is that something that you use frequently in life coaching circumstances or is it just depending on the circumstances? It's, you know, I, I use a lot of my intuition. I do use the model a lot, but there are certain, you know, um, conversations where my intuition tells me it's more appropriate to use Byron Katie's model, Mm -hmm. which are four questions. Uh, Is this true? Can I absolutely be sure this is true? Who am I? How do I show up? What happens when I believe this? And who would I be? How would I show up? Who would I be if I didn't believe this thought, if I didn't have this thought? And that, mm-hmm. that brings so much clarity. And, mm-hmm. and it, it just, it's on an intuition basis, which one feels more apt. Right, apt- right. And that's what happens a lot with coaching. I do more executive coaching. So we're, we're often assessing peers, uh, those above someone, uh, workers below, so we can get a 360 view. We do some assessments, um, uh, predictive index or strength finders, and we use that as a base, but you're looking at it at a different level to get results that really lead to more of these life changes. I suspect the life changes lead to career adjustments, Whereas I'm more yes. career focused that may lead to life adjustments, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I want to emphasize a component that, so this seems pretty heavily, um, that model, it, it seems when people first interact with it, it seems heavily uh, emphasized on the mind. Mm-hmm. The, the F part of the model that's just as important to interact with, and that's the feeling. And the mm-hmm. feeling is the energy that really does create the results. Right. And I, what I teach my clients is what's called emotional maturity, emotional resilience. And that mm-hmm. is key if you're going to get any kind of uh, changed result. And uh, I, I like the model too, whereas, you know, how you said you could see different ways of self-talk. Mm-hmm. But the model is also really useful to, to really analyze the way you self-talk, even in a positive way. Mm-hmm. So for example, I was... Um, a long time in my life tried to avoid feeling inadequacy and, mm-hmm. and the feelings of feeling um, like a failure, right? My, mm-hmm. my thoughts told me I was a failure and then I would feel inadequacy. I wanted to avoid feeling that. And so I would positive self-talk by saying, oh, that wasn't in alignment with what I want anyway. I didn't really want it that bad anyway. It's okay. It's actually a blessing that that didn't work out for me. Mm. Um, that would have been too much, that would have taken too much sacrifice to get what I wanted, mm-hmm. what a blessing, right? It seems like positive, like self-soothing talk. Soothing, but, really, but not positive, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. When you plug it into the model, it's like, nope, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so then, you know, and if you really want to interact with reality on reality's terms, you have to look at things honestly. And that was a way of using denial. Right. So that I could avoid feeling something. And a right. feeling is really when you just really interact with feelings is you realize they're just feelings. Right. And our right. brains are trained to avoid negative feeling. And we have this sort of pain intolerance that has been taught. And our society, you know, there's this refrain, like live a happy life. That's the goal right. is try to find how to live a happy life. Will you ever notice how unhappy you feel trying to just be happy? <laughs> right, right. And it's this emotional intelligence or, or emotional resilience is a way of just accepting that life comes with everything pleasure right. and pain right. and accepting that pain is part of the deal. And when we get to that point where we can just accept pain and um, interface with it in a meaningful way, then right. we don't let our fears of feeling feelings stop us from doing what we want to do, which is right. really the reason why anything stops us. Any, yeah. Anytime we think we can blame a circumstance or a person to keep us from what we want, it's really just we're afraid of feeling a feeling. Right. Right. And many of us were not taught that. And the reality is that these feelings are a continuum of good and bad. And giving ourselves permission does not mean that we're, we are falling victim, as you alluded to early, to that particular feeling. It's just what's happening at the moment. So I, I'd like to wrap up with the thought that, I, that you had mentioned, which I feel really strongly about, and that's that level of emotional intelligence that we need to invest in ourselves. And from a business perspective, invest in our teams, and from a personal perspective, invest in our families, because that gives us that emotional resiliency and eventually the emotional maturity that you were alluding to. So and it helps us to make better decisions in business. I yes. know so many business owners that make really poor business decisions because they don't have emotional maturity. They make right. decisions based on whim and feeling and it doesn't work out well. <laughs> right. Well, what we find is that if we don't address them at the time of experiencing them, they come back and bite us in the behind anyway, don't they? <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> well, thank you so much investing time with me today on this uh, episode of C2C Coach to Coach. And I'm so glad you shared your experience with us and your expertise. And uh, well, I look forward to connecting Thank with you, you soon. Thanks so much.